Welcome everyone and welcome to everybody on Zoom. It's really um, Barbara from Bali and um, I think Sam and Anan, whoever else is on there, we welcome all of you and welcome to everybody in here. We're going to be doing things a little bit differently today. It's going to be a little bit reflective. Um, I'm not quite sure how it's going to work, <laughs> but it's just... What I'm sensing is that there needs to be what I'm sensing is that Jesus, Yeshua, needs to be exalted. Yes. Needs to be exalted above the things we know in the word. Needs to be exalted above what we do with the word, like our ministry, whether it's generational, whether it's courts of heaven, whatever it might be. Jesus and Jesus alone is to be exalted. So we're going to worship at the end. Um, and there's a little bit of a, a reflective. So I hope you've all got pen and paper. If not, um, I was going to say beg, borrow, and steal, but that is not kingdom. So do not do that. <laughs> Ask people if you if you if they have a pen or paper you you may use. Um, but Jesus has to be more real to us than the person you're sitting next to. He is to be more real when you open the word to see Jesus in every scripture. or if not maybe every scripture, but he is the living word of God. So we're just going to open in prayer. And we just I just want to um, talk about Jesus because he is captivating me more and more every day. Father, we just thank you so much for your goodness. You are God the good. You are Abba. Father, you withhold nothing from your children. And you sent your son because you so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish or have everlasting, or should not perish but have everlasting life. And then you said in John 3, 17, that you did not send your son into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through Jesus, through the Messiah. You gave everything when you gave your son. And uh, we ask that this afternoon, Father, you would be glorified. Jesus, the Christ, would be enthroned and that Holy Spirit, your presence, your power and your revelation of Jesus would be released within each and every one of us. Jesus. You are our Lord, our God, and our King. We enthrone you. Jesus, we enthrone you. And Holy Spirit, if there is anything in our hearts, that has moved Jesus to the side. We repent. We renounce it as a sin. And we ask you to reinstate Jesus, Yeshua, where he needs to be. That he would truly be Lord and King of our lives that we would not be so caught up in teaching or ministry or principles 
that they would overtake our King. Jesus, be glorified. And I ask that everyone here and everyone on Zoom would have an encounter with you. That we would experience you and encounter you and you would bring change, transformation. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to pray for Israel later, but I want Jesus first. Oh, he is everything. We can be so caught up with other things that he no longer is our preoccupation. Our preoccupation can come with, oh, well, I'm studying this in the word or I'm doing this. Or, and our, we are preoccupied with that instead of Jesus in that. He is everything. He is so important to the Father that the Father actually said that all the fullness of the deity will dwell in him. The fullness of the deity dwells in Jesus. And uh, George MacDonald in his book, Diary of an Old Soul, said, Christ, my life, possess me utterly. Take me and make a little Christ of me. Christ must always be preeminent, supreme, sovereign. Um, he's everything. We don't follow Christianity. We're not Pentecostals. We follow Christ. We don't preach principles from the word of God. We must preach Christ first. We shouldn't be shouting, come to church. We should be shouting, Jesus Christ is born, come to him. He is everything. But we don't really talk about him that much. We talk about a lot of things from the word of God. We have the Beatitudes, we talk about the Beatitudes, the courts of heaven, we talk about the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit. There's so many things that we can discuss. But unless Christ is preeminent, we're missing the point. It's always Jesus. He is incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, enthroned, exalted, triumphant, glorified, reigning Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah, the Christ beyond the tomb who ascended and took us with him. He is everything. He is everything. He is before all things. The whole universe is held together in him. Right, It's all held together in him. He is the glue. He's the gravitational pull that holds all of the created elements together. Jesus is everything. You know, we only got saved because of him. I didn't get saved because of the church. I didn't get saved because of the ecclesia. I didn't get saved by anything except Jesus Christ, the crucifixion, the power of his shed blood. I got saved because of my king. I got saved because he went to the cross and he took my sins, my shame, my guilt, my punishment. He took everything that was wrong in me and he made it right in him. And it's because of him that I'm saved. It's because of him that we've got a call of God upon our lives. It's because of Jesus. And we, we can't allow our ministries to come above Jesus. We can't allow our prayers. People, I've got this or I've got that. It's Jesus, front and center, supreme, sovereign, all in all, it's Jesus. And he was the language of Paul. 
We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but it's Jesus. He is the fullness of the deity. Everything of the Godhead is in Christ, everything, and he is within us. That's the mystery of it all, that Christ is in us. Christ, the hope of glory, is in us. And we talk about everything but Jesus. We don't say the name, whether it's Jesus or Yeshua, whether it's Messiah, the anointed one. We don't really talk about it. And as I said last week in the book of Acts, they were said, you can teach anything. You can talk about anything, but you must never mention the name of Jesus. And even in churches, we talk about the Lord. We talk about Abba. We talk about the Father. But very rarely is the name Jesus released. We might tack his name on at the end of a prayer. Because we were told that's what you do when you pray. But why? Why do we do that? What's the reason for that? There were three reasons for that. Why is that name above every other name? It doesn't matter what other name we mention, whether it's cancer, death, death. It doesn't matter what name. Bill Gates, it doesn't matter what name. His name is above every other name. It's him. And then he said in Matthew 28, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's Jesus. Are you truly walking with Jesus? Is he your best friend? Are you his best friend? In John 15, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Servants do what we're told to do. We're given jobs, we're given assignments, we're told to do certain things, we do it, but we're not invited to participate as a friend. We're not invited into the planning as a friend is invited. So are you a friend of Jesus? He says he calls you friend, but are we friends? Are we friends? He is amazing and he's wonderful, but we need, I, I really believe that he has to, he has to, he has to come to the front. He has to come to the front. He's the second Adam. He's the glorious Christ. He defeated death and the curse. He defeated the grave. He had defeated the entire world system. He is the glorious Christ who, you know, he, he defeated sin, Satan, and condemnation. He's the glorious Christ who took all of our shame. He is the glorious Christ who conquered guilt. He's the glorious Christ who towers in triumph and victory over each and every one of us. He is amazing. He is so grand and so glorious, and yet he is walking along Side, beside you, whether he manifests as the lion of the tribe of Judah, whether he comes as the lamb of God. You know, often I've seen him as the lion of Judah padding around open heaven. I've seen myself walking through Rabina Town Center and every now and again, the lion just walks with me. You know, we see so many different things. Um, years ago when I was worshiping, uh, Jesus came to me. I have had the amazing privilege of seeing him so many times. And he rolled out a map of the world on the floor and he said, come dance with me over the nations. And over, over the nations I've danced over, some of the nations I've visited and there's more to come. When I was sick, he came to me and he showed me his back after it had been lashed with the cat of nine tails. And he said to me, did I do this for you for nothing? Because I must admit I was drawing it out a little bit. I was a single mom. Mum had moved in. She was taking care of the kids. It was nice to stay in bed. So I wasn't in a hurry to get well, you know what I mean? I was over the worst, but I was sort of like milking it. And Jesus came and he said, did I do this for you for nothing? And he showed me his back. And yet when I looked into his eyes, I could have said, yes, you did. And he would still have loved me. I have never felt such freedom of will. But I said, no, you didn't. And I got out of bed and it changed. He changed me. He came to me once and he said, uh, what do you want? And I said, I want the nations for your glory. Hold out your hand. And he dropped the nations into the palm of my hand. 
He comes. He visits. He touches. He changes. He restores. But it's about Jesus. It's not about the church you attend. It's not about your devotions. It's not about what you teach. It's what about it's not about any of that. It's not about who you follow on the on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. It's not about anything but him. Because he is the word. He is the plan of the Father. He is the fullness. He even said it's better for us that he goes back to the Father so we can have the Holy Spirit. So anytime the Father spoke in the Gospels, it was always about this is my son. This he is my delight. Listen to him. The Father pointed to the Son. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus as well because he comes to reveal Christ to us. He comes to, to um, the things that the Father tells Jesus. Jesus tells the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells us. But he points to Jesus as well. And we get so caught up thinking, well, it's about church. It's about the service. It's about this. It's about that. It's nothing but anything but Jesus. First and foremost, preeminent, prominent, supreme Jesus. He has to be the first the first love, the first desire, the uh, holy obsession, if you like, consumed by the anointing. You're in him, he's in you. There's this just this div divine union with, with you. But when we recognize who he is, when you recognize who he is, he is the father's greatest pleasure. This is my son. He is my delight. It's everything about Jesus. Where there is hostility, he will bring peace. Where there's separation, he brings unity. Where there's death, he brings life. He created a whole new creation. We became that new creation when we were born again, which makes us part of the race like himself, as he is, so are we in this world. First John 4, 18, as he is, so are we in this world. He is not bound by time or space, therefore neither are we. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are not bound by anything that he is not bound by. Everything was created by him, through him, to him, and for him. He is the originator of everything. Let me turn to Colossians chapter 2. Let me just read Colossians chapter 2. You want to get caught up in Jesus, Colossians, Ephesians, Colossians, Colossians 2. Verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. And you, each and every one of you, are in him, made full, having come to a fullness of life. In Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you reach full spiritual stature, for he is the head of all rule and authority. He is the head of every angelic principality and power. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, but in a spiritual circumcision performed by Christ by stripping off the body of the flesh. And it just goes on and on. You know, it's all about Jesus Christ. It is all about him. And um, we cannot afford to allow anything else to usurp his place as our Lord, our King, and our God. It says in verse 28 that Christ we preach and proclaim, warning and admonishing everyone, instructing everyone in all wisdom that we may present everyone mature, full grown, fully initiated, complete and perfect in Christ the anointed one. And Paul says, I labor in this in Colossians 1.29. I labor in this, striving with all the superhuman energy which he so mightily enkindles and works in me. What does he labor in? Preaching and proclaiming Jesus. 
preaching and proclaiming the Christ, preaching and proclaiming the Messiah, preaching and proclaiming the Savior. That's what we have to exalt and lift up. You know, it's not about, you know, you need to get saved so you can go to heaven. It's got nothing to do with it. You need you need to be saved so that you can enter into a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit so that you can recognize that you're now a part of the race, not a human race anymore, but you're now a part of the race that Jesus Christ is the head of. He's the head, you're the body. You're part of the body we need to be aligned and integrated into the body with christ you are his body cell to cell flowing together his blood bringing life to each and every one of us it is about jesus it is not about anything else but him the messiah you know it is about the, the son of god the son of man they call it the hypostatic union 100 man 100 god he is the son of man he is the son of god he's the root of david he is oh my gosh the branch there are so many things that he is he's the morning star do you know that if you go through the seven days of creation jesus christ is revealed in all of them day one he's the light he is the light of the world let me just give you the scriptures. It is just amazing. He's everywhere. Let me just, oh, I just really want to um, just bring everything back to Jesus. So I've got it in these notes. Here we go. So Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be light. And God created the world with the word, Jesus, the word. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In day two, there is water. Um, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters above from the waters below. And God made the firmament and separated the waters, and it was so. Well, you know what? That that he is um, if you turn to John chapter 4, verse 10. I'm flipping through the Bible. But this is where the woman at the well. And he said to her in, in John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered her and said, if you'd only known and recognized God's gift. And who this is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him instead and he would have given you living water. So Jesus is the living water. Day three, when they separated the waters uh, and separated the waters which were under the expanse from the waters which were, oh, sorry, verse three, that the waters under the heavens be collected into one place that the dry land appears. So there's a separation. Day three talks of the resurrection when he rose from the dead because there's a separation now from between land and water. There's a separation. So death separated. It's talking about the resurrection right there. Uh, let me just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. He was buried and he rose on the third day as scriptures foretold. And that's your correlation between the third day. On day four, it says that God created the, the sun and the moon and the stars. Well, Christ is the sun in Malachi chapter four, verse two, let the sun of righteousness rise with healing in its wings. He is the sun of righteousness. He is the moon. He is the morning star in second Peter chapter one, verse 19. Jesus is the morning star in Revelation twenty two sixteen. He is the morning star. So all of the way through creation, what it's doing is revealing Jesus. You know, we need to have Jesus revealed in our life we need to reveal Jesus how can we walk with somebody that we don't see revealed he is in um day the sixth day you know where they created the animals so Christ is the true lamb he is the lamb of God John 1 29 behold here is the lamb of God He is the model man. When God created Adam and Eve, Jesus is the model man. Romans 5, 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 47. And more than anything else, Christ is the Sabbath. He is our rest. He is our rest. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. 
But uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30 in the message translation says, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burdened down with religion? Come away with me, says Jesus, and take a real rest. You find your rest in Jesus. You don't find your rest in a vacation. That, that's nice. You can find your rest, you know, lounging in front of the TV. But Jesus Christ is your real rest. And when you learn to rest in him, it says that you will walk in the pace of grace, that there's a flow of heaven that that walks through you he says walk with me work with me watch how I do it and you will walk in the pace of grace for my burden is easy my yoke is light it's all about Jesus the king of glory the king of kings the lord of lords the bright morning star the son of righteousness with healing in his wings it's all about Jesus he is amazing and he's wonderful. So he's all through creation. It opens up with creation. I don't know if I wrote it down, but I was listening to someone the other day teaching on the Hebrew. Do you know that in Genesis, oh, every 50th letter spells out Torah? Every 50 letters, the word Torah is spelled out. In Exodus, every 50 letters, the word Torah is spelled out. Skip Leviticus and go to Numbers. Every 49 letters, the word Torah is spelt backwards. In Deuteronomy, every 49 letters, the word Torah is spelt backwards. Why? Because Numbers and Deuteronomy are pointing back to Leviticus, pointing backwards. Genesis and Exodus are pointing towards Leviticus. And every seven letters in Leviticus spells Yahweh, Y-V, Y-H-V-H, every seven letters. Why? Because that talks about the sacrifice of the perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ, to atone for our sins. In the Hebrew, than we could ever understand, but it's all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. And we must guard his preeminence in everything that we do. I want to read this to you. I've got pieces of paper. I'm cleaning up, but I'm finding stuff everywhere. The mystery of God is this, that the one who is the visible image of the invisible God, this is Jesus, the one in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells, the one who is the living residence of the Trinity, the one in whom eternity lives and breathes and has, has its being, mm -hmm. the one who is before time, the one who is the A to Z, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is the firstborn of the created universe who rose from the dead never to die again, the conqueror of death, sin and the grave, our creator, our saviour, our redeemer, our forgiver, the one who holds all creation brought together in himself, the one who is the power of glory and might, the head, the authority, the source of the church, the one through whom and for whom all things were created, the one in whom all things find their meaning and reality, the one who reconciled all things in heaven and earth to God, the one who nailed his body to the bloody cross, every law, every rule and every regulation was nailed there that would condemn the beloved people of God, the one who is supreme in every realm, the one who holds the first place in all things, the son of the father's love, the one whose significance is unmatched in human history, the one who holds the title deed to the universe, the glorious, the limitless, amazing, incredible, expansive, incomparable, marvelous, stunning, staggering, majestic, mighty, matchless spectator, the outstanding, tremendous, immense, infinite, vast, grand, triumphant, victorious, precious, radiant, peerless, wonderful, magnificent Jesus Christ has chosen to place all of his fullness in you. That is all in you. That is all in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. All of the things that describe Jesus, he has placed within you. He's placed it all there. The kingdom of God is within you. Everything that Jesus is, he has made you a partaker of because he's an heir of God. And, and you're a joint heir with him. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Everything Jesus has belongs to you. Everything that Jesus is and has is in you. 
You are a different race. You are not a human being. Jesus. Amazing, glorious, triumphant Jesus. Compassionate Jesus. The one who can, you know, multiply the loaves and the fishes. The one who raises the dead out of compassion. He had compassion for the sick. He had compassion for the hungry. He had compassion for people. Jesus. It's Jesus who lives in you. It's Jesus who walks in you. It's you who walk in him. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is your shepherd, your advocate, your mediator, your bridegroom. He's your conqueror, your lion, your lamb. He is your sacrifice, your manna, your smitten rock, your living water. He is your food, your bread, your drink. He's your good and abundant life, your dwelling place. He's your Sabbath and your rest. He's the new moon, the jubilee, the new wine, your feast. He's your aroma, your anchor. He is uh, your wisdom, your peace. He's your comfort, your healer, your joy, your righteousness. He is your sanctification. He is is everything to you. He is um, your glory, your power, your joy, your strength. He's your prophet, your priest, your king, your kinsman, redeemer, your teacher, your guide. He is your liberator, your deliverer. He's your prince, your captain, your vision, your sight, your beloved. He is your way, your truth, and your life. He is your author, your finisher, your beginning, your end. He is your age, your eternity. He is your all in all. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, yet he is new every morning. Morning. He is beyond all of this. He is your king, your judge, and the true witness. He is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the one that we serve. He is the one that you walk with. He is the one who indwells you. You indwell him. Oh, my gosh, if you just knew the weight of the glory that you carry on the inside, the weight of the crown of honor and glory that he's crowned you with, if you just knew how to wear the mantle of favor, the mantle of blessing that he's given you, if you knew how that you were divine health that you live in health every day of your life because he is your health and it's by faith in his name that you healed healthy and whole before all it is jesus it is the shepherd he's the one who leads you and guides you he directs you he gives you the green pastures the still waters it is jesus we need to know him more and more and more every day allow him deeper and deeper into yourself that he might walk with you in a way that you've never known, that you could have an encounter with him, that you would experience him, that you would be changed by him, consumed by him, that when you speak, your words drip with the blood and the anointing because all you are speaking is Jesus. Oh, my gosh. He is everything. He is everything. And we can go with amazing teachings. We can go with this and that. But unless Jesus is the Lord of it all, unless Jesus is crowned, unless Jesus is supreme, it burns up when it goes through the fire. And we want to bring him gold and silver and precious stones. And we do that when we recognize it's Jesus. It is Jesus, the one who loves you, the one who walks with you, the one who took your sickness and disease away from you the one who has given you his mind, the one who, who's, who his love flows through you, Jesus. Jesus. It's all about him. When you walk with him like this, the ecclesia takes on a different glow. When you understand Jesus, it's about him. We're followers of Christ. We're not Pentecostals. We're not this and we're not that. We're followers of Christ. Amazing Jesus. So this is what I am going to, we're just going to reflect on him and then we'll worship and we'll pray. So you know me, I write down things. I've got, so this book is, is his book. 
But it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Because he's your future. Proverbs 3.26 says that Jesus is your confidence, firm and strong. That he keeps your foot from being caught in a trap or some hidden danger. He's your compass. He is everything. He is the draw. He is the drawing card. He said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He's the drawing card. He's the drawing card. I don't know where I wrote this. I'm looking for it. Here we go. Here we go. So if you want to choose... We'll, we'll all go. We'll do Colossians chapter 1. There's 29 verses. But there are 30 references to Jesus Christ. There are 29 verses, 30 references to Jesus Christ. It might be he or him, but there are 30 references to Christ in that first chapter. Or you might decide that you want to do Philippians, the first chapter. That's got 30 verses and 20 references. And we won't look at these, but just for interest's sake, I guess, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 9 has 11 references to Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10 has 13 references. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, five references. And Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, four references. Now these were all written by Paul. And the scripture that comes to mind is Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Paul was captivated by Jesus. That's what Paul wrote about. That's who he loved. That's who he lived for. That's who he obeyed, Jesus. So if you want to go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 29, we're going to take 10 minutes. And I'm just going to ask you, just you've got pen and paper, just go through that for yourself and just read it slowly. And if there is anything there that strikes you about Jesus, about the Christ, <clears throat> write it down. Because the Holy Spirit will show you what Jesus wants to reveal to you about himself. So Colossians chapter 1, the whole chapter, just read it slowly and write down anything that marks you about Jesus. You think, I don't know you like that or I want to know you more like that. And let's start with that as a platform to grow into a revelation of Jesus Christ. Is that okay? It's a bit different today. Or we'll just give you time. Same for people on Zoom, Colossians chapter 1. Mark down anything about Jesus that stirs you.
about Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, Messiah. Yes, you can't walk with somebody unless you know them. And I, I can, I can't walk with principles, but I can walk with the Prince of Peace. I can walk in the kingdom, but only because I know the King. It comes back to a relationship with Jesus. So how much do you know him? Is he your peace? Is he your life? And when you open the Bible, is it just to study or is it to have an encounter? I want to know him. because I want to be able to represent him well to the people I, I meet with, talk to, do business with, minister to, whatever. I want to represent Jesus well. Sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit like those sideshow mirrors, you know, where you stand in front of them and you're all squiggly and out of proportion. And sometimes I think, oh, I don't think I really represented Jesus well in that situation. It's a bit like a... Sideshow mirror, he's a little bit out of whack. But um, the more we know him, the more we know him, the more we reflect him. I was studying Isaiah at 1 o'clock, and the thing with Isaiah is that he had this incredible encounter, you know, like the, the Lord fills the temple and his train fills the temple and he's high and lifted up. And, and I, if we have that kind of an encounter with, with, with Yeshua, with, with the Christ, with the Messiah, whatever you want to call him, you know, like I'm, I'm actually called Suzetti in other countries, Suzetti. Um, you know, it depends, if different countries, different pronunciations. But, you know, if, if you truly want an encounter, ask for an encounter because we want to be changed. You know, we want to be, have that, that encounter like Isaiah was, oh, God, I'm undone. You're just too magnificent. You're too awesome. You're too glorious. And I recognize that this in me has got to change, a, a man of unclean lips or whatever it might be. But, but, Lord, you are just so exalted. You're so lifted high. There's no one like you. And yet you want to walk with me as a friend. Oh, to have an encounter with him. I'm not talking about a revival and I'm not talking about an awakening. I'm talking about a relationship, a relationship, deep and abiding. And in this, you can go as deep as you want. So I would encourage you when you when you spend time in the word, approach it as Yeshua. He is the living word of God. He is the living word. So Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things in your word. That's from Psalm 119. I think it's, oh, I'm not sure of the verse. But Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things in your word. And don't like, I know that we can be creatures of habit and think I'm going to read so many, so many chapters a day or I'm going to do this or that. Read the word slowly like you're in a conversation with Yeshua. And when something in a verse touches your heart, camp there. Pray about it. Talk to the Lord about it. When he touches your heart, he wants to impart something. And too often we think, oh, yeah, that's great. We'll underline it and move on. But he's wanting us actually to camp there. He's saying there's riches in this that I've got for you. There's a revelation in this that I've got for you. I want to show you some marvelous things that will be just what you're looking for. And then revelation comes. And inside revelation, there's always the key to victory. 
Revelation always carries victory. Revelation always carries an understanding. Revelation always unlocks things. So go graciously through the word, recognizing that every word is Jesus. He is the living word. And this, when you start to pray the word, recognize that when the word leaves your mouth, it's come out of your spirit and you've released the word into the atmosphere by a decree or by a prayer or whatever, you have actually released the Lord Jesus Christ himself into that situation. You've released him into that. That's the power of praying or decreeing the word. You are releasing him into that situation. 